Hi there. Today I want to talk a little bit about shale gas, something you've undoubtedly heard of. It's in the newspapers almost every day. It's an enormous resource with tremendous opportunities and uh, tremendous challenges. You, you probably have heard the basic story, and that is producing natural gas from shale formations, formations that are full of clay and organic matter, um, is a remarkable new resource, new in the sense that we can now produce gas directly from these formations. These geologic formations are the source rocks for conventional oil and gas deposits, and now we're producing uh, the, the gas directly from the source. The estimates of how much gas can be produced are, are, are truly enormous. And, and in North America alone, we appear to have about 100 years of natural gas available to us at more or less current consumption rates. Now, this map shows in red the areas where shale gas is being developed. In kind of a reddish-green color, you see areas where both gas and liquid hydrocarbons are being produced. And um, in, in green are areas where shale gas technology, horizontal drilling, uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing are being used to produce oil from low permeability, traditionally uneconomic reservoirs. So both shale gas itself and shale gas technology are having a major impact on the energy picture of the United States. It's not only true of, of, the, of the United States and North America, it's true around the world. And this uh, assessment, which is now a little bit more than a year old, which was not able to consider many parts of the world, which are shown in gray, nonetheless show that recoverable natural gas resources can provide about 140 years of supply at again, current consumption rates. And this is just enormous, and of course these numbers will go up markedly. Now what's, what's really interesting is that almost every week or every few weeks in the news, something major is occurring uh, on, the national, on the international scene. And uh, a couple weeks ago, the USGS estimated that shale gas, recoverable shale gas from off the uh, East Coast is probably a very modest resource. It probably won't be developed. There's just not enough gas there. Poland uh, was in the news because Exxon decided to pull out of Poland, but Poland's a big country. There's a lot of shale gas uh, potential there, and many, country, many companies are, are still active. There's tremendous interest in producing gas from shale in the Middle East. Uh, this may seem odd, but there's a tremendous domestic need for natural gas, mostly for electricity production, in countries such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, and so on. And they're looking at producing natural gas from shale uh, very hard these days. And China has just launched a multi-billion dollar program to do re research and technology development for shale gas uh, development in China. And, and of course, you know, Natural gas is a much cleaner uh, source of energy, especially for um, electrical power generation. Um, it generates half as much CO2, none of the mercury, none of the particulates, none of the socks and NOx, the, the traditional pollutants that come from uh, burning coal for electricity. And so it, in, in the United States, we've seen a dramatic shift away from coal and toward natural gas. Uh, in the last four years, we've gone from 50% of our electricity coming from coal to 30% coming from coal. A dramatic shift in just four years because of the, uh, the availability of, of cheap and abundant natural gas, and we've dramatically reduced our greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants because of this. Hopefully the same thing will be happening in China, South Africa, India, Australia, all countries that are very dependent on coal for electrical power generation. Now the idea about extracting gas from the, these organic clay-rich source rocks has been around for a long time, but it wasn't until two technologies came together in the Barnett Shale, the area around Dallas and Fort Worth and uh, central, north central Texas, um, that, that we actually demonstrated that it could be done. And in the Barnett Shale, the process of, of drilling horizontal wells, creating multiple hydraulic fractures, 
and then those hydraulic fractures actually stimulating tiny little microseismic events in the reservoir. Uh, together, these processes resulted in a dramatic increase in the number of wells being drilled, 14,000 wells by about 2010, and a dramatic increase shown in red of the amount of natural gas being produced. So this process of horizontal drilling, it had been invented and used for other purposes. Hydraulic fracturing has been around for about 60 years. Um, they were put together and, and modifications were made, but the process proved itself to be capable of extracting economic quantities of natural gas from rocks with extremely low permeability. What do I, what do I mean by low permeability? If you think of a sort of a conventional gas reservoir, the, the shales that we're talking about producing gas from have a permeability that is one million times smaller than a traditional gas reservoir. This is what the data look like. Um, in reality, this is the Barnett Shale. Uh, two pads, two places where a drill rig was set up, two horizontal wells about a mile long were drilled from this pad, three horizontal wells were drilled from this one. They were hydraulically fractured from what's called the toe of the well back toward what's called the heel of the well. They were each hydraulically fractured about 10 times. And these colored dots represent tiny little microseismic events that occurred during the hydraulic fracturing. This is what's breaking up the shale and enhancing the permeability. These events are so small that they can't be detected unless you put seismometers at depth. In fact, a typical magnitude is like mag magnitude minus two. That means on a patch about this big, a, less than a tenth of a centimeter, a tenth of a millimeter of slip is occurring. Or another way to think about it, the uh, same amount of energy is released as a a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter. These are very, very tiny events, but in aggregate, they're enough to change the permeability of the shale and, and make it productive to produce gas. And that, that is the key. A number of very important questions remain. Are we optimizing production? Estimates are that we're only producing about 25% of the available gas. That's not very good, it's not very efficient, and of course, um, we can get more gas with, with, with less drilling, less hydraulic fracturing if we do a better job of optimizing production. Can we accurately estimate ultimate recovery? I showed you these um, estimates, 100 years of natural gas um, in, the, in North America, 140 years. I, I, obviously, the number will be much, much larger when we uh, take in these large parts of the world that weren't considered, but nonetheless, you know, hundreds of years of natural gas at a, at a global scale. Uh, can, are these numbers accurate? Are we doing a good job? Are there any, any things happening out there that we don't understand? Are there potential technology barriers? Are, are we able to really extrapolate from our North American experience in, in sort of a half a dozen different places uh, to these uh, global resources with, with some degree of confidence. And of course, how do we minimize the environmental impacts? We're talking about tens of thousands of wells being drilled. Um, in North America alone, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of hydraulic fractures being done. How do we minimize the impact of all this uh, to make it possible to, to utilize these resources but not do environmental damage in the process? Now, one of the interesting scientific questions we have is, is exactly how gas production is, is, is occurring. And, and we kind of you know, know the, the main parts of the story as I've explained it, but there's a lot we still don't understand. This graph shows the average monthly production from wells drilled in the Barnett Shale in July of 2004, July of 2005, and July of 2006. If you look at the individual well data, they're scattering all over the place, but if you look at this monthly average, it kind of uh, shows you what, what, what the average well is doing. And you can see a couple things in this data. First is that the production from the wells declines very fast, and, and there's actually been uh, a lot of discussion of this, and from an economic perspective, it means that an operator simply has to earn back their investment and make a profit in just the first two years. And um, after that, the production is much less. Now that's 
of course, you could say that's a problem, right? All the gas comes out rather quickly, and then, then um, much less gas is, is flowing. But, but there's also a, a couple of other things going on. First, between 2004 and 2006, in just a two-year period, notice that the average well production is essentially doubling. So industry is getting smarter. The wells, the horizontal section of the wells is getting longer. The number of fracks are increasing. The way in which the fracturing is done is being improved. So the well technology is getting better. The wells are getting more productive. Everybody benefits from this. The other thing that's kind of interesting is this very persistent production in the out years. Now we, we, we look at the Barnett Shale because you know this whole thing started in the Barnett Shale and we only have about 10 years of, of experience. So we don't have very much experience and this is the best data we have and we see and what is very unexpected is this very constant production. We would have expected the wells to continue to decline and they don't. And, and, and so why is that? It's a really interesting scientific question. And in fact, some of the, some of the operators are hypothesizing that the wells are going to last 25 to 30 years. If that's true, we get a lot more gas out for no extra effort. That's good. Um, and you know, it, it will have a major impact on not only how we view the resource, but how we, review, we view the operational activities and the environmental impact. It means that when we, we think about these wells, we should be thinking over a multi-decadal time scale, not just what's going to happen in the next few years. So it's very important to understand what's happening both in sort of an economic perspective and in a land use uh, perspective, and environmental impact perspective, and so on. The reason we don't really understand these things is, is, is the very basic origin of the shales. Now this is a scanning electro, electron micrograph image of the Eagleford Shale um, in South Texas. And these flat spots are just an artif artifact of how the sample is prepared. But this little black lens is a waxy organic substance called kerogen. It's you know, this rock is 90 million years old, and this originated, um, you know, in, in um, an organism that was buried in this mud uh, in the sea after it, it died and, and, fell, and fell to the bottom. Now, if we look at that kerogen, this, this organic material, a little bit more carefully, we can begin to see some pores, holes going through it. And if we zoom in even further, we can see uh, the holes a little bit more clearly. And these are on the order of, of about 100 nanometers across. So these are extremely tiny pores. It is the chemical changes of the kerogen that are producing the gas, and that gas has to flow out of these extremely tiny pores. And to make a long and complicated story short, we think that this, this kind of flattening of the decay is actually a result of a transition from seeing the gas come out of fractures and larger scale uh, void spaces in the rock to where it's actually coming out of this very small pore space. And it's by studying this process at the nano scale that we're going to answer some of the questions about how much gas we're going to get out and how much, um, how long these wells will, will persist. Now, we can't have this discussion without looking at the environmental impacts of shale gas development. And these environmental impacts uh, appear in multiple forms. Can surface contamination be prevented? Carrying things uh, to the drill site, operations on the drill site. Is there appreciable gas leakage from the wells, the pipelines, the distribution system? This has been uh, an important issue for a long time, and it's, it's recently uh, become important because if there's a lot of methane leaking, it offsets the benefit of the reduction in CO2. Methane's a very potent greenhouse gas, and we, we, we need to do everything we can, not only in the pipeline and the distribution system to prevent leaks, but actually during the drilling process itself to make sure no gas is leaking from the well as the well is being drilled and fracked, and then afterward. How do we properly dispose of or reuse the flowback waters after hydraulic fracturing. The hydraulic fracturing process itself is, is very safe. There really has been 
no environmental problem ever documented that is directly attributable to hydraulic fracturing. There have been plenty of environmental problems. Okay? But after hydraulic fracturing, the water that comes back out of the well picks up a lot of salt, it's very saline, picks up heavy metals, and needs to be either reused or disposed of properly. Can hydraulic fracturing potentially contaminate water wells? There's this great fear that this is, is happening, has happened. It's, uh, in fact, there's no documented case in which it's ever happened, but it's, it's something we have to deal with because the public is concerned about it. And we've also had, in addition to these tiny little magnitude minus two earthquakes I described before, we've had some larger earthquakes, as large as magnitude 4.7, widely felt, but earthquakes that cause no damage, uh, associated with the injection of flowback water. And this, um, you know, is a real issue. These earthquakes so far haven't been large enough to cause any significant damage, but potentially they could. What are we going to do about it? Well, we kind of know and kind of understand this problem, and we have to address it. Uh, we have to address it properly. The problem we have right now is that all of these environmental problems are wrapped up into kind of a, a bumper sticker, no fracking, no fracking, no fracking when in fact it's not the hydraulic fracturing process that is causing the environmental problems when they occur. So the, you know, what we need to do is we need to identify the, the, the problems and we need to solve them and we know how to solve them. And if we have you know, good field procedures, if we have good regulations, if we have appropriate inspection and testing of the wells, these problems are going to go away. Hydraulic fracturing has nothing to do with it. I had the pleasure of serving on a high-level DOE committee that, that looked at these problems. We issued two reports last year. Um, the first 90-day report talked about what should be done. The second 90-day report talked about um, progress toward, toward achieving those goals. And uh, we, we addressed some of those issues. We do recognize how important this resource is. Um, and we also recognize that it can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. That doesn't mean it is being developed everywhere in an environmentally, environmentally responsible manner, and there's um, more to be done. So it's an extremely important uh, energy uh, resource. It's now 30% uh, of, of all natural gas production in the U.S. And, and growing. Natural gas has traditionally been 25% of our energy mix. It's growing because of its replacement of coal for electricity. Um, shale gas development has a large positive economic effect, jobs, uh, obviously, and it can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. The main thing that has to be done is to drill, case, and cement the wells properly. And this is very mundane. It's not a very sexy topic for research. Um, uh, but nonetheless, and it's something, and something we, know, we know how to do, but it's not always being done. And this is an example taken from, um, uh, from private industry, from a, from, from a fellow uh, named George King, who's done thousands of hydraulic fractures. And he points out that what is common practice of putting steel casing and cementing it in place to about 500 feet, which is the um, recommended practice of the American Petroleum Institute, and which does a good job of isolating the near surface aquifers, that may not be good enough. Because as you drill down and then eventually into the shale that you're going to produce the gas from, you'll go through various layers. There could be little coal seams. There could be minor gas-producing shales. So if these are producing small amounts of gas and they come into this space bet between the steel casing and the wellbore, they can bubble up. And then we have a single barrier, the cement in this area here, to prevent them from causing contamination or leak leaking to the surface. That's not very good. What George points out, and in fact is easily done, is to run a second string of steel casing and to cement properly so that we, we seal off these minor gas producing zones. And now we have a double barrier that prevents leakage over time. And if these wells you know, are going to really last 25 to 30 years, we want to create as many barriers as we can, and we want to make sure those barriers are effective before proceeding with production.
Very simple, very mundane. And some of the companies are doing it just right. This is Range Resources operating in Western Pennsylvania, and they were very proud to show us their multiple strings of casing in what they call uh, a coal string to get to, to uh, seal off a coal layer, an intermediate string to get some of these um, minor gas producing zones uh, behind pipe and behind cement and to create multiple barriers to prevent leakage over a long period of time. So this uh, is the cover from Time Magazine about a year ago. Uh, this black rock is in fact a gas bearing shale formation and as, as, as you can see uh, the uh, headline is this rock could power the world. And then in small print it says it's right under our feet and there's lots of it but there are these environmental problems that have to be considered and, and, and that just about you know sums it up. Um, will gas be abundant and low cost? Absolutely. It's a game changer. It's a game changer in the United States, in North America. It's a game changer around the world. It's a fundamentally different energy pick, you know, system that we have today than we had a decade ago because of clean, cheap, and abundant natural gas. There's no question about that. So, yes, we can count on it. But whether we're talking about the science and engineering of, of producing these resources in an optimal way, or we're talking about how to reduce the environmental impact, there's still a lot of work to do. And uh, it's important for us to engage these problems in many different ways, and I invite you to uh, participate in that process. Thank you.